the general recommendation is 10 to 12 grams per kilogram of body weight. So for ease of numbers, if you were 50 kilograms, you would need 500 grams of carbohydrates, right? Um, for your shorter races, so if you're more so in that half marathon, you can probably aim for that more closer to eight to 10. But for a marathon, I always do between 10 to 12, depending on how much a person can tolerate. And you mm. don't want to consume this like the day prior. We want to space this out over 36 to 48 hours from an event. And if you have a more sensitive stomach, I do can, I will extend it to 72 hours out just depending on that personal preference. But good rule of thumb is that 48 hour mark. Hey guys, welcome back to the Adaptive Zone podcast. My name is Matthew Boyd. I'm a physiotherapist and running coach. Today, we're going to be talking to Stephanie Small again, who's a registered dietitian who specializes in endurance athletes. And she's going to be talking to us about carb loading, which I thought was quite a pertinent topic at this time of year, given that we should be leading up into the taper for some fall races. So it's quite a quick one because it was quite straightforward. And uh, we just wanted to stick to the sort of facts with this one and give some good takeaways. So get your notepad ready. It's a good one. And there's a few things about carb loading that I was getting wrong. So you might be too. So hope you enjoy that. Don't forget to sign up for my free online course. It's the Running Fundamentals course, and it teaches you all of the fundamentals about running, training, and performance. Just check the link in the description and fill in your details, and we'll send you one module each week. Anyway, that's enough out of me. Let's get into it. Okay, so Stephanie Small, welcome back to the Adaptive Zone podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited. So today we're going to be talking about carb loading. It's a timely thing with a lot of fall races coming up in the near future. But before we get into that, could you just introduce yourself again? We've got the previous episode I can refer people back to that they can check out with you, which was one of my more popular episodes. So it's, it's exciting <laughs> to have you back on. And yeah. um, but could you just tell us a little bit about you and your professional work uh, before we get into it? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a registered dietitian. I do primarily focus in on the performance side of things. And I work a lot uh, with the recreational endurance athletes, but some more elite as well. Um, I work with all sports, but I have kind of found myself in the niche of endurance sports. I do marathons myself. Um, and I also do research in carbohydrate metabolism. So I've kind of developed that niche area. And so it's really exciting to to be able to work with people and teach them how to feel themselves properly. So that's a little bit about me. Cool. And yeah, if anyone's interested, go back, check out the episode that we did that was called uh, How to Lose Weight with Running or something like that. I don't know. I forget yeah. what I call these episodes, <laughs> but it was excellent. So uh, we go in depth there. But today we're going to talk specifically about carbohydrate loading or carb loading or carbo loading. And it's, well, why don't you tell us what it is, Steph? Yeah, absolutely. So carb loading, I think people commonly refer to that of like stuffing your face with pizza the night before, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Carb loading essentially is practicing is the practice of topping off your muscle and liver glycogen stores and glycogen just refers to stored carbohydrates. And you do this by consuming a large amount of carbohydrates a few days leading up to a big event. And it was actually developed in 1964 by a Swedish scientist cannot pronounce his name, but he identified that positive correlation between the amount of glycogen in the body and endurance performance. And it's kind of taken off since then. So is it essentially the more carbohydrate you can take on board in those few days, the more glycogen you'll have, or is there, is there more limiting factors around that? Yeah, it's a multitude of things. So in general, we can store about 700 to 1200 grams of carbohydrate in the muscle. The liver is closer to about 400 grams. But what's really awesome is that as runners and as you become an endurance athlete, your ability to store carbohydrates becomes higher. Um, 1200 grams is, tends to be kind of like that higher end of average, but people could potentially store more. Um, so it kind of depends. But eating big bouts of carbohydrates like leading up to the race just make sure you're reaching your maximal capacity of glycogen stores okay and is this something that we need to do for all races or is it just the longer races 
Yeah, great question. So for your shorter distances, such as like a 5K or 10K, you tend not to need to carbohydrate load. So the reason why you want to carb load is because one, it makes sure that you stay fueled throughout longer distances. So for example, 75% of your fuel um, throughout a marathon is coming from carbohydrates. So you're running through your carbohydrate stores quite quickly. Um, and you typically start to reach the bottom of your carbohydrate stores within that 45 to 60 minute period. Um, that can be extended with carb loading and of course, intra workout fueling. But for races that aren't extending to that period, you don't need to carb load for it just because you're not using that much carbohydrates. However, you still should practice pre and post um, run nutrition just to make sure you are getting some fuel. Okay, so if we were going to say a rule of thumb, would it be if your event will take you less than 45, maybe don't worry about it too much. And if it's more than 45, then you probably should be doing some form of carb loading. I think so. I think um, half marathon is when I would start a some form of carb loading and then okay. but definitely for a marathon. Yeah, okay. And then 10k. Maybe if you're, you're not a particularly fast runner, then it might be worth doing a little bit if it's going to take you like upwards of 90 minutes kind of thing. Yeah. So if it's just a 10K or if you're um, going to be running for longer than 45 minutes, that's where um, pre, pre-run pre nutrition comes into play. So you can increase your glycogen okay. stores by having like that pre-race high carbohydrate meal and maybe having some gels throughout that run or right before the run just to make sure you're you have that appropriate fuel. But you won't run out of glycogen in that short of a time okay so if we stick to like half marathon marathon and longer yeah how would you recommend someone go about carb loading how do they know how much carbohydrate they should take on and and you know is it just the day before the night before is it is it the whole week or longer um, how would you suggest someone work that out and decide yeah great question so the general recommendation is 10 to 12 grams per kilogram of body weight so for ease of numbers, if you were 50 kilograms, you would need 500 grams of carbohydrates, right? Um, for your shorter races, so if you're more so in that half marathon, you can probably aim for that more closer to eight to 10. But for a marathon, I always do between 10 to 12, depending on how much a person can tolerate. And you mm. don't want to consume this like the day prior. We want to space this out over 36 to 48 hours from an event. And if you have a more sensitive stomach, I do can, I will extend it to 72 hours out, just depending on that personal preference. But good rule of thumb is that 48 hour mark. But if you were doing it for the week or the two weeks prior during your taper period, that wouldn't necessarily help you that much. It's really about what you do in the sort of three days before the run. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so if you were to do it longer than the three day period, there are a couple things at play that may actually start to impair performance. So you may be, first of all, you're just on a, a rabbit wheel. So if you are tapering, you are still going on runs and things like that. So you're constantly loading and deloading. And that, that's a little bit of an unnecessary amount of carb loading. But then second thing is that you would initiate some unwanted weight gain if you did it longer than, than the two or three days, which can also slow your running, right? Um, mm. While you will experience some weight gain with a carb load, because it's important to remember for every gram of carbohydrate you store, you're going to store three grams of water. So when you do carb load, expect one to two kilograms, sometimes three, depending on how large of a person you are. Um, but that's also going to help with hydration, especially if it's hot because you are storing water. But that one to three kilograms shouldn't impair performance. But if you start to get more than that or increase your weight more than that, that's when performance can become impaired or a little bit slower. Okay. And in your experience, how well do runners normally do this carb loading? I think it depends on how much they're into the nutrition side of things. I think the kind of like I mentioned before, the common misconception is really just stuff your face with pasta or pizza the night before. And I see that quite yep. often. Um, <laughs> and I would say probably for the most part, that's what the, I see. And so it's kind of reframing that and reshifting to be more intentional with your carb loading. Um, okay. So, so, yeah. so what's the problem with stuffing your face with a, a pasta pizza combo the day before? Yeah. They actually did a study on this and individuals who ate a high carb, high fat meal of either pasta or pizza actually had impaired performance the next day. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so you'd be better off doing nothing. Right. <laughs> Just, <laughs> okay. I, I thought that was an interesting study and quite ironic. Um, <laughs> But what's happening is is people were consuming this just massive quantity of, of food and it was one taking a really long time to digest. And so you can start to like see stomach issues even that following morning, but it's also extremely high fat. And so people were actually carb loading. They were more so fat loading because those food groups, mm. while they do have carbs, they're actually predominantly fat sources um, contributing to a fuel that we're not necessarily using for the most part during that run. Yeah. And I guess that's to do with taste, right? So if you, mm -hmm. if you go out for a meal, particularly, I know they, they do tend to be high of fat because it, it really helps with the taste. Whereas if you were a more carby, starchy only food, I can imagine it being sort of more bland, right? You know, potatoes, rice, it, pasta, yeah. but not so heavy on the sauce, the oils, the things like that. Is that what's going on there? Yeah, exactly. Cheese, I think, I guess. Yeah, most people are are a little disappointed when I tell them that they can't have pizza. I tell them like you can have that after your run um, because they are, <laughs> I give them, like you said, really plain carbohydrates. And a lot of people, I know carbohydrates gets a bad, bad rep, but carbohydrates is actually really hard to overeat. Eating 500 oh, to yeah. 600 grams of carbohydrates is extremely hard to do. Um, and that's also the additional benefit of doing it over a, a 48 hour period. Yeah, I can testify to that because, you know, after we, um, oh yeah, for the listeners, Steph's my favorite person in the world at the minute <laughs> because we had a consultation a few weeks ago and she told me I wasn't eating enough. And since I started eating more, I feel like a thousand times better and my running's going better <laughs> and I feel better and stuff. So just for some context here, I'm a big fan of Steph right now. Um, but in doing that, what I've been doing is just like logging my food reasonably well on my mm -hmm. fitness pal, the app. And um, I can see my like macros. And you know, I'm nowhere near 10 grams per kilogram, like that'd be 800 grams of carbs mm -hmm. for me. And on a typical day, and I, I eat a lot of carbs, to be honest, um, compared to a lot of people, I think just from mm -hmm. observing what other people are eating at lunchtime and stuff. I, 400, 500 kind of thing is is pretty typical so me trying in that three days prior to get up to 800 is going to be quite a challenge so say someone is going to work that out right say you weigh 60 kilograms and you're like okay i need 600 grams of carbs for three days prior what kind of foods would you recommend and how would you recommend they go about approaching that to avoid some of the problems they might have with you know well, I guess so. Yeah, I don't want to give you too many questions at once. But is this in addition, like if you have about 2000 calories a day, is that like, okay, you start carb loading, and that goes up to 2500? Or do you does your carbs sort of replace some of the calories you would get elsewhere? Sorry, that's two questions at once, but I, you can handle it. Yeah, uh, I think that's a great question. So uh, on a Typically, I calculate just like independent protein, fats, and carbohydrates for a carb loading period. Does that equal calories? Yes. You will see an increase in calories for those days, absolutely. But um, not you're not gonna it's not gonna be like a direct representation of what you've been doing plus carbs. So, for example, I do tend to drop fat a little bit just so that we are focusing on mainly carbohydrates uh, sources, minimizing any GI upset, um, and then protein. Depending on the person, I may drop it just a little bit just to kind of so they can handle the carbohydrates, right? Um, so you are going to get a little bit less calories because we are removing the proteins and fats just a little bit. Um, but because the carbohydrates tend to be so significant, it is going to be more calories overall. Okay. And then what kind of foods would you recommend? So you three days prior, you've worked out how many grams you need. So mm -hmm. let's say, let's say 50 and then 500 grams to keep it simple. So you need yeah. 500 grams of carbs. Like how would you suggest, what foods should they use? Yeah, so big two criteria when it comes to choosing foods. One is you want it to be foods that you're familiar with. So try not to introduce any new foods because that may cause uh, new symptoms or GI upset, and especially when some people get anxious before races and that can just exasperate any problems. Um, and then two, of course, making sure it's low fiber. So an example, briefly of a day, suppose that's about 500 grams of carbohydrates. For breakfast, that could look like a half a cup of dry oats, um, a half a cup of berries, or a half a banana with eight ounces of orange juice. Then your mid-morning snack is 
two of the Nature Valley oat bars and four dates. Lunch, two slices of bread, um, a half a cup of chickpeas with a one cup of grapes and a, about a cup of chocolate milk. Then your mid-afternoon snack is a medium sweet potato. And then your dinner, one and a half cups of cooked rice, which is a pretty big portion of rice. Um, <laughs> and then about a, two cups of some type of sports drinks. And that's just a carbohydrates alone. So that is in itself a very like large volume of food. Um, so another key takeaway there is just making sure that you are eating more so five to six times throughout the day, just to make sure you can get in that volume of food from pure carbohydrate sources. Yeah. Okay. So they were good examples. A few of them were there in there more what, you know, you might think of as like sugar. So mm -hmm. the sports drink, um, there was some others in there, yeah. but where does that fit in? Is it, is it, or cause obviously if you have, you know, cookies, ice cream, uh, things like that, they, they're going to have a lot of sugar in, and that is going to be quite a bit of carbohydrate. Can we use that to help us hit those numbers that might be challenging for us without having such large, like rice, for example, you'd have to have a lot of it, as you said, mm -hmm. can we use things that are very sugary to supplement? Or is there a problem with using those as opposed to say more whole foody type stuff like rice and potatoes and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I do advocate um, a com mostly whole foods. My rule of thumb is 80%. Um, but there is typically like, you know, 20%, we have to use more foods that are labeled as unhealthy or more sugary. Um, I think that in itself is a nuanced topic. But um, like I said, the sport drinks are a really great alternative chocolate milk. Um, I would be hesitant on more so like baked goods, such as cookies and cakes and ice cream, because those actually do tend to have quite a bit of fat as well. So just be cognizant of okay. that. Um, but you could go to more of your sugar based sweets, such as gummy bears, um, cereals, really a great option. Cereal is easily digestible and people can take in a large quantity of cereal. Um, pair yeah. that with some, some milk. Milk has carbohydrates in it too. And you have you know, 60 to 70 grams of carbohydrates right there. So yes, you can use those sugary foods, but make sure that you're cognizant of which type of sugary foods and if they have a lot of fat in there as well. So not so much the baked goods, not right. so much the ice cream or the cookies, but yes, you know, a little bit from things like candy mm -hmm. and um, sports drinks. Is that a good summary? Yep. Yep, absolutely. And it's not okay. to say that you can't have the cookie, like definitely if you want the cookie fit it in there, but just don't like eat 12 cookies because you think it's going to carb load you, right? Okay. Eat a pile of gummy bears. Yeah. <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> yes. Okay. That's in that's interesting because that's not what I thought. I thought the, the sort of baked goods and stuff would be okay, but I guess what you're saying is there's so much fat in there. It's going to give you a lot of calories from fat and limit your opportunity to then get calories elsewhere from carbohydrate, which is really what we want in those right. three days. And yeah. should there be anything different about those three days, like an increase? Or is it just like three days of, you know, let's say 500 grams a day, try and keep it all the same? Um, that depends on the person and how sensitive their stomach is. So if this is your first ever carb load and you calculate you need 600 grams of carbs leading up to your race, um, I would recommend probably airing on the lower end of that and kind of seeing how your stomach can handle it. So if this is your first carb load, you can also do practice carb loads if you're far enough in your race in advance prior to a long run, but, um, take it a little bit easy. So for example, I have a client coming up on the Edmonton marathon. And so I didn't give him his full 10 to 12 grams of carbohydrates because he's a little bit more of a sensitive stomach um, and he's never carb mm -hmm. loaded in this way before. So I, I reduced how many grams of carbohydrates he's having and made it a three day carb load. So if this is your first carb okay. load, err on the side of having a little bit less. So maybe seven to eight grams per kilogram of carbohydrates and then build okay. up from there. Um, but if you can have that full 10 to 12, uh, the two days, two to three days prior, go for it but test it out first. Okay. So say someone's, you know, 50 kilograms, they're looking at 500 gram mm -hmm. for 10 grams per kilogram. But if they haven't done it before, they might for the first day, try 400 grams, mm -hmm. see how that felt. 
And then if it was difficult, they might do 400 and then the next two days do the same. But if it was like, oh, that was easy, they might try and go to 450 or, or 500 in the in the subsequent couple of days. And if yep. you have time, it would be better maybe at some point during your training cycle, say if you're like six weeks out or something, you've got a long run coming up, do a, like a sort of rehearsal so you can get a sense of how to do it. Is that about right? Yep, Absolutely. Uh, it's it's extremely crucial to always test out feeling plans when possible. It's not always the case. Sometimes we don't have time. And so that's where making sure you're choosing foods that you're familiar with prior to or for your carb load is extremely important. Um, and understand that things may change in the, in the last moment. So let's say you planned out your perfect carb load um, and you went on the lighter side and did, you know, eight to nine grams per kilogram because this is your first carb load and you're eating and you, you start to feel a little stomach upset or it's making you a little bit queasy or something like that. It's okay to back off. Like if you have a set plan, go based off of how you feel and make adjustments as you go. If you feel comfortable and confident, don't force yourself to meet that goal because that's the requirement, um, especially if this is your first time doing it. But if you can kind of set those guidelines, set goals and plan out your carb load, you're you're more likely to not necessarily hit those goals, but uh, serve yourself better for a performance perspective. Hmm. And I guess when I was listening to you with that sample plan you just gave us, there wasn't tons of fruit in there. There was a little bit of dried berries and, and like the odd banana and stuff. But I'm guessing if someone were to try and really increase their carb intake through fruit, they might have trouble then because of there's a lot of fiber in it. And mm -hmm. if they're not used to it and they eat more than usual, they might have trouble with them um, like uh, GI distress either on the race day or, or before. Is that something that happens? Yes, absolutely. So more of your, your fibrous fruit such as berries sometimes if you eat the apple skin and those sort of things can cause that increase in fiber that can cause some gi upset but also fruit is higher in fructose fructose metabolizes a little bit differently in the intestines and so i don't necessarily want to overload the intestines with too much fructose but it's perfectly mm -hmm. okay to eat fruit so i tend to yeah. aim for the lower fiber more uh, carbohydrate dense fruits so think of banana mango um, pineapple, kind of those sort of fruits that are just really uh, carbohydrate dense. Okay. So that takes us through those um, three days. And then on the morning of, what are your suggestions for people when we're talking about what to eat the morning of? Yeah. Um, Pre-race fueling is like my favorite because I think that can, I wouldn't say make or break or run, but can make you feel good um, or you can start to see lower performance levels. So when you go to bed that night, and you start your fasts just because you're sleeping prior to your race, right? Your body's gonna start to use your carbohydrate stores. Is it going to take all of it? Absolutely not. But you're gonna lose about 10%, sometimes 20% depending, um, just by sleeping at night. So it's important that you have two things. One, a pre-race meal two to three hours prior to running. This can be hard for people just because I know races tend to be at like six or 7 a.m. Um, but I do have athletes that'll wake up at four or four thirty, and they have their meal as soon as they wake up, so they can start digesting it. Again, you want to keep it extremely simple. So think a half a cup of oatmeal and one banana, right? Okay. And that's one of those. Go ahead. Oh. Sorry, I was just going to ask if you miss that two-hour window, and say you you only up an hour before the race. Would you then be better served by not eating anything or would eating something small be worthwhile? What happens? Yeah, so you want to go smaller and more digestible. So if you overslept or maybe you're not a morning person and you want that hour, then that's where I would encourage more so of like beverage-based things, so such as fruit juice or a sports drink. Okay. And then like gummy bears or even start to have like one or two gels to kind of get in the carbohydrates. Okay. And... Right before the race, so you're at the start line and you've mm -hmm. got your fueling strategy, which we discussed a little bit last time, mm -hmm. but let's say you're going to do a gel every 20 minutes as a common one. Should you have one like then at the start line or should you wait 20 minutes? I've always wondered that. Yeah, I always recommend at the start line. Um, I'm a huge proponent of preloading as much as possible. So what I mean by that is having as many carbohydrates earlier on in the race so that you can maintain that feel good feeling, keep your performance high. And if 
you know, some chance maybe it's a hot day or something isn't sitting well and you start to have stomach upset a little bit later on the race because you preloaded you you're better off as far as like a fueling standpoint to maintain the rest of the run. You're going to be messed up a little bit by the GI upset and stuff like that, probably. But as long as you can make it to the end of the race, I think that's really important to kind of preload and prepare your body for that period in the event it happens. Okay. And then what about after the race? Oh, after the race, uh, definitely have something as fast as possible. But instead of carbohydrates, we want a combination of carbohydrates and protein. This is one going to help with the recovery process, but it's also going to help help you feel good. The more you delay that um, that in, that fuel post post run, especially if it's a marathon or longer, you, you're just your recovery slows down. It just starts to slow down the longer that we wait. So if we can have something immediately start that recovery process, the better. Um, I typically recommend a carbohydrate to protein ratio of two to one. And I like to see at least 30 to 45 grams of protein. Um, and most commonly, this is going to be in the form of a shake or chocolate milk, um, maybe pairing a protein bar and like a sports drink or something of that nature. You may not be hungry. Still, still try to like start taking bites or start sipping something. Most people aren't going to be hungry, but you're just delaying that recovery process. The chocolate milk, it's, it's, it's science backed. I, I never heard of it before I came to Canada and the runners here were like obsessed with it. And I, I was it. like, whatever. <laughs> but I didn't realize it was a, a real thing that actually works. So there you go, people. Chocolate yeah. milk after your races. <laughs> it's a beautiful ratio because you're getting about 16 grams of carbohydrates and eight grams of protein um, per, <laughs> per glass. So that's the perfect two to one ratio. So you, you can't lose that way. Okay, we need a vegan alternative, Steph. You know I don't. Oh I don't yeah, I drink forgot. Dairy milk. I'll have to <laughs> find so, chocolate. Soy milk. Soy milk is a great soy alternative. Milk. So, so great, I need yeah. a chocolate soy milk. Yes, soy is very okay, comparable to, to chocolate milk, uh, cow's milk. So yeah, but it's got to be chocolate. Yeah, I can't just have plain soy milk. That's a, that's a very depressing thought at oh, the yeah. end of a race. It's not going to gonna make me run any faster. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll find a, a a chocolate version. Yeah, no, I think that'd be great. I, I, <laughs> I, think, I think we hit everything there. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you would like to let runners know about carb loading? No, I think you asked all the questions. Um, honestly, just keeping it simple, trying to increase those carbohydrates and keep those fats low are the biggest takeaways in my opinion. Cool. And uh, yeah, my challenge to listeners would be to... <laughs> When you finish listening to the podcast, have, you know, work out your weight, work out the, you know, eight to 10 grams or 10 to 12, depending on what you're going to do. And then start having a look at the foods that you might use to do that. And then ideally make a plan. And if you want to help with that, definitely reach out to Steph. I'll put your link in the description who will make it very precise for you and uh, make sure it's optimized correctly. So I'll, I'll put links to uh, book in with you if people want to do that in the description to this episode. So thank you again for making the time to come and talk to us today. And um, yeah, we will uh, hopefully get you back on again soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me.